It feels like Guts's sole purpose in life since we've gotten to know him has been to kill Griffith. Beginning the series with the Black Swordsman arc was a smart move by Mura because it showed us his main character's core conflict and thoroughly impressed upon us how impossible it was to achieve. The arc that followed gave us the backstory behind his desire to kill Griffith, and to be honest with you guys, we get it. If the one man we wanted to impress more than anyone else turned around and treated us like that, we'd want to hunt them through alternate dimensions as well. The phrase, Never Meet Your Heroes hasn't even been invented yet, but maybe Guts was its progenitor in this universe. Which brings up a rather relevant question, why hasn't he killed Griffith yet? Circumstances have changed considerably since the Black Swordsman arc was published all the way back in 1989. His sword has harmed a God Hand member before, so why is Griffith still breathing? And more importantly, will Guts be able to kill him now that he's basically a god? We'll look at all that and more in this video, so strap in tight, because this is going to be a a bumpy ride. Let's begin. Guts' life purpose is killing Griffith, but finding him is next to impossible. Speaking of the Black Swordsman arc, it was a breakthrough not just for Miura as a manga artist, but for Guts as a character as well, because by its end, he'd managed to accomplish something he'd previously thought impossible, locating Griffith. See, for the first few years of their association, finding Griffith wasn't a problem because, well, he was Guts' leader and Guts was his lead lapdog. The pair were on opposite sides of a siege when they first encountered one another. Griffith's fault had held the fortress for three months, but Guts had managed to turn the tide by killing one of his best soldiers, Bazuso the Grey Knight. By happenstance, or perhaps by fate, the two came face to face shortly after when some of Griffith's mercenaries jumped Guts to avenge their fallen comrade and loot his corpse while they were at it. What these poor idiots didn't know was that their opponent had been fighting battles since he was nine years old and death itself since he was born. Guts was 15 or 16 when he came across the Falcons, but he'd already spent two thirds of his life fighting as a mercenary. In that time, he'd watched his adoptive mother die, been ruthlessly drilled into becoming a killing machine, been violated by a comrade, and forced to kill his father due to a misplaced notion that Guts was some kind of cursed child. To say that he was like a rabid wolf would be an understatement. In those days, you were liable to get your head split if you even touched him. But then, Griffith defeated him in battle twice, earning his sword and trust, and everything changed. Guts found a true home with the Falcons in the three years he was their raider captain. He even found love in the most unexpected of places with Casca, but above all else, he, like all of his new brothers in arms, was dazzled by this common man's grand vision. Working towards Griffith's dream gave him a purpose similar to the one he felt when he was swinging his sword for Gambino's sake. In many ways, Griffith inspired Guts as much as he frustrated him, because now he had a role model to aspire to. When he finally got the courage to do something on his own terms, he failed to recognize how it would affect a man who had come to depend on him for the realization of his dream. And that's where things went completely off the rails. During his year apart from the Falcons, Guts discovered his purpose as a warrior who seeks to test himself against the impossible, but lost track of those he once called brothers. When he resurfaced in the world following his peregrination, tracking Griffith became his first priority because he'd heard about what happened in his absence. He found his former leader a broken man in the bowels of the Tower of Rebirth, but if he'd been the perceptive kind, he might have noticed that he'd already lost Griffith to the Abyss. In that year of separation, the Falcon had been tortured to the brink of insanity, and in that time, he'd come to see Guts as the cause for his pain. Griffith was willing to play along with the rescue mission just to see what would happen once he got back in charge, but the realization that that was never going to happen again broke him completely. Guts had braved scores of armored knights and an apostle to break him out of prison and to find him again, but little did he know that this would be one of the last times he'd ever get to see him, as a human being, at least. Once Griffith's mangled body was exposed to his soldiers, all his hopes and dreams of becoming king were dashed. He'd seduced Charlotte for the throne, not for her love, and yet now she was willing to run away and abdicate her inheritance for him, and he didn't even want her. He might have tried leading his men from the shadows if his body were allowed to heal, and perhaps Judo could have used his connection with Puck to get some elf dust for his wounds, but once Wild outed him, it broke his spirit. That was a worse blow than the one he dealt to the Falcon's morale, because they were still willing to do something for Griffith, even though he couldn't lead them anymore. He repaid their kindness by offering them up as sacrifices so that he could become a demon. So we guess this guy owing you favors is worth less than nothing, it's a lifetime in hell. But in becoming a demon, Griffith also fundamentally altered his own existence. Before he activated the 
Behlet, he was just a man. He was made of flesh and blood and bone, and all Guts had to do to kill him was track him down, which he probably would have if he learned that Griffith had tried forcing himself on Casca. But once he became a God Hand member, his existential form changed from being physical to being purely astral, and he became unreachable in the literal sense of the word. As Femto, Griffith's first act was to finish what he started as a human, and we wish we were talking about his dream. Femto's violation of Casca is the reason Guts is hunting the man he used to look up to and admire, because it's clear that this thing is no longer Griffith. At least, not in the way that he mattered to Guts. The last time the Black Swordsman had seen Griffith before the eponymous arc was during the Eclipse, because that's the only time it was possible for him to do so. As a god hand, the only thing that could get him to Griffith now was a behelet, and in his two years hunting down apostles, he'd never managed to recover one. That changed during the Black Swordsman arc when he found one in his pursuit of the slug count. And he even managed to see Griffith again, but this being berserk, this meeting wasn't quite as simple as you'd expect. During his battle with the slug count, he dropped the behelet he'd recovered from his former physician and inadvertently allowed the dying apostle to activate it. Because he bore the brand of sacrifice, he was sucked into the interstice along with the count and his daughter, and that's when he finally got a chance to act on his impulse. Guts was in no shape to take down a regular soldier, let alone a god hand member. The slug count had bashed him around real good. He had broken ribs, and he'd probably cracked his spine, skull, and a dozen other bones in his body. But just the presence of his target was enough to rouse him to action and make him swing for the head. Guts was barely conscious when he was doing all this because of the pain from his injuries, and all he managed to accomplish when he was conscious was nearly getting himself sent to hell permanently. As a sacrificial offering, Guts' body and soul belonged in the abyss, so when the god hand summoned the vortex of souls to devour the Count's soul, it reached out for Guts as well. Loading up his arm cannon and firing a parting shot at Griffith was all he could do to save himself, even though he knew it was in vain. Griffith's new powers allowed him to manipulate space itself, and he tanked Guts' gift without so much as lifting a finger. When he left, so too did Guts' hopes of seeing him again, because he didn't quite remember how the behelet was activated. A combination of pain and heightened emotions blinded him to the mechanics of how it opened an interstice, so even though he had a behelet, he couldn't use it. And when he found out how it worked, it made things even worse because it involved his least favorite thing in the world, fate. After going through several trials and tribulations and picking up a few friends along the way, Guts finally meets someone who can explain to him just how the hell this weird egg in his satchel works. It takes well over 200 chapters, but he gets there, and that person is Flora. The witch of the Spirit Tree Mansion explains to him that a behelet is a highly spiritual object linked to human fate. It could only be used by the one that was destined to use it, and it was sure to be in their possession the moment they craved their power. Since there was no way of knowing whether Guts was one of those people, considering his path over the last couple years, it was unlikely that he was going to be able to use this key himself anytime soon. And this was the biggest obstacle in Guts' quest to killing Griffith for the longest time, because in order to kill someone, you have to find them first. And if you're literally not destined to do so, then how do you go about your mission? Well, turns out fate doesn't always favor the bad guys, because something happens about halfway through the story that makes his problems a lot easier to deal with, but also a lot harder at the same time. Even when Griffith is in his grasp, he's a thousand leagues away. You can't kill something that doesn't exist the way living beings do. A thought cannot be cut out of existence, a feeling cannot be murdered. As a massive body of some of humanity's most evil and negative thoughts, Griffith was immune to any mortal weapon and out of reach for any that dared pursue him and his brethren. Yet, at the same time, there was a problem with his current condition. It limited his ability to fulfill his dream. The only reason he'd accepted the God Hand's deal is because they'd promised him that they would give him the castle and kingship he'd always imagined would be his if he simply gave them his soul and those of his comrades in exchange. Griffith agreed, perhaps unaware that he wouldn't be going back to the physical world anytime soon, but still very interested in obtaining power. However, once he got that power, any concerns about being blindsided would have subsided thanks to his connection to causality. A king needs a body to wield the sword and sit the throne, and for the second time in his life, the stars aligned on his path. Shortly after defeating Slug Count and his Eclipse pal Rosine, Guts got roped into an adventure that gave Griffith exactly what he needed to pursue his dream in earnest, a body of flesh. For all their power to interpret fate itself and bestow incredible and terrifying powers upon those who choose to follow them, the God Hand can't steer the causal ship ship without a hand on the wheel. They can influence events as long as they like, but to cause any true change, they need a presence in both worlds. That's exactly what the incarnation ceremony was designed to accomplish, and in order to trigger it, what was needed was Guts' brand of sacrifice. Well, his and Casca's to be more precise. When the branded pair enters the vicinity of St. Albion, 
The collective effect causes the malign spirits gathered in the region to converge on the Tower of Conviction, which erupts with the blood flow of the dead. Hundreds of human lives are devoured by a massive tidal wave of living blood, all of which surges into the egg of the perfect world when the promised time arrives. All the flesh and souls that the blood flow had gathered in its wake reconstitutes Griffith's old body with the egg's womb, and when it hatches, the white falcon soars again. Griffith returns to Earth, posing as its angelic savior, but those who are the closest to him know his true nature. This demon king now intends to extend his rule over another dominion, and though they are finally in the same world, Guts still can't kill him. It isn't because he doesn't want to, although that is a part of it, it's also that he can't match up to his enemy's powers. When Griffith incarnated into the physical world, he came back with all his god hand powers, including spatial manipulation. If anyone got close to harming his physical body, he could simply make it so that that never happens by redirecting the trajectory of all incoming attacks. He's escaped hails of arrows and dozens of battles with humans and magical creatures alike thanks to this, and even Guts has failed to find a solution to it. There have been two separate occasions where he's been faced by the demon that haunts his every waking moment. The first happens shortly after Griffith's incarnation, and the second happens shortly before Miura Sensei's tragic passing. In the first instance, Guts and Griffith don't make actual physical contact, but the fact that the latter is commanding Zod as his new right-hand man should tell you all you need to know about how accessible he was going to be. The second time, Guts does get an opportunity to corner Griffith and unleash an attack on him, but much like every other weapon in the world, Dragon Slayer can't find a way through to him. This means that even though they share the same physical space, Griffith is still out of Guts's grasp and this infuriates him to no end. He's currently experiencing the worst emotional spiral of his life because of it, but this also brings us to the other reason he isn't hunting Griffith as intensely as he was before his incarnation, and that is Casca. In the immediate aftermath of the eclipse, Guts was so traumatized and full of rage that his instinctive response was to get on the warpath against Griffith and his demons. He'd lived his life as a mercenary, he was going to show those bastards what that kind of training can end up creating. But after the Black Swordsman arc was concluded and Guts met Puck, he started to ease back into his old self. That included fighting not just to kill, but to protect as well. And this is where Casca becomes important. What happened to her at the Eclipse broke her mind, and for a long time she had no one to protect her because her only protector abandoned her and buried himself in his own grief. Guts left Casca locked up in Godot's ore mine to exact revenge from the apostles that killed their comrades, not once considering how she was going to end up feeling because of it. But when she escaped to Saint Albion and that led to the incarnation ceremony, he decided his revenge could take a backseat to his love. Casca was the one that defined his humanity long before he put a gravestone on it, and when her life was endangered, Guts snapped out of his rage quest. He decided to become her protector first and foremost, and every move he's made since has been in lieu of that decision. Hell, he's passed up chances to fight Griffith to keep his love safe and sound, which is something we couldn't even have imagined him doing during his Black Swordsman days. It's clear from his actions that he's doing his best to let go of all the negativity inside of him in service of the greater good, but in truth, he's like a cracked damn wall that's just waiting to break under pressure. On more than one occasion, Guts has found himself wondering just how long this detour would last, because while Casca was extremely precious to him, he's still clinging on to the past. Guts had admonished himself for nearly forgetting the malice that kept him alive all those years he was hunting Griffith, just because he has friends once more and can actually share his daily burdens instead of enduring them all by himself. It's great for his people skills, but for his personal mental health, not so much. This is the same guy that created a mental construct to give his feelings towards Griffith an outlet that didn't drive him crazy. The Beast of Darkness wouldn't be here had Guts's need for revenge truly vanished, and yet, though they were now in the same world, the threads of fate were working overtime to keep them apart. While Griffith got to work on making his dream a reality and taking over the remnants of Midland's political structure, Guts was focused on keeping Casca alive and, best case scenario, bringing her someplace where she'd actually be safe. That place turned out to be Elfhelm, which conveniently enough was on the opposite side of the world to where Griffith was operating. Guts could have chased his mark at Vertanus once he realized that the White Falcon was also attacking Emperor Ganishka, which meant that he would be in the same encampment close to the city. In fact, he thought about doing it. Even though he'd been nearly zapped to death on multiple occasions, and was only dissuaded by Zod's threat to him and his friends in that moment. Guts and Griffith were in the same city at the same time, and yet he chose Casca's well-being over his needs. It's funny how the thing you desire can be right in front of you and still feel like it's a thousand miles away, but that's exactly the position Guts was in during this period of his life. He was aware of Griffith's agenda, he knew that he would try to take over Midland first thanks to the groundwork they'd already laid, and then move on to the rest of the world. If he wanted to, he could have found him anywhere people worshipping the Flying Falcon of the Holy See were, but he didn't because his priorities had shifted. Guts kept his Casca 
Hera's stance going strong all the way up until the latest arc where it shattered him because something happened that no one saw coming. What was supposed to be a routine visit from the Moonlight Boy ended up resolving the mystery of his identity, and it turns out that he was none other than Griffith, or at least partially, anyway. The Moonlight Boy is the manifestation of Guts and Casca's demon child through Griffith's new body of flesh. When the egg of the perfect world was invoking the incarnation ceremony, he made a slight change to the plans by swallowing the dying demon child out of sympathy. This fused the child's soul into Griffith's vessel, creating a vulnerability he had no control over. Every night of the full moon, the child would take over his body and seek out the warmth of its parents for the short time that it had control. And this brings us to the final section in our story that might just explain what we've been trying to go over this entire video, which is... Will Guts be able to kill Griffith after learning his true nature? Throughout Berserk, there have been many moments where Guts has changed his mind about something or someone once he's seen what they're all about up close and personal. But the one thing he never changes his opinion on is demon kind. Even though he wields a blade in a more defensive stance since taking on companions, whenever he comes across agents of evil like apostles, all logic and love flies out of his mind and is immediately replaced by rage and homicidal intent. Guts isn't working towards towards Griffith's death only. He wants to eradicate all demons from existence, and yes, that also includes his demon child. Upon its birth, Guts didn't realize that he was Billie Jean in this song. He must have assumed that the demon was yet another torturous gift Griffith had left him with because he immediately tried to stomp it to death. But then Casca moved to protect it, and Skull Knight explained that the child's fetus had only been mutated by Griffith's seed. It didn't create it. The creator of the demon child would be Guts himself, which adds another layer of tragedy to his character. A lot of people tend to forget that Guts is the father of a demon, and that kind of thing becomes tricky when you vowed to eradicate his kind. For the two years that he was active as the Black Swordsman, Guts often shooed his own child away, afraid of it and repulsed by it in the same breath. But things are different with the Moonlight Boy. See, Guts didn't know that his baby is now within Griffith's body. In fact, the first time the Moonlight Boy shows up is the first time Guts thinks of the demon child since the night of the incarnation. He thinks to himself that perhaps the lad is still out there somewhere, creeping through the endless night, totally unaware that he was sleeping right under his nose. He treats the Moonlight Boy far more humanely than he ever did the Demon Child, and by the time Chapter 364 rolls around, the pair have actually built up something of a rapport. In that chapter, the Moonlight Boy plays at being a knight with his dad, while his dad is completely in the dark about who he is. It's a touching moment of bonding that is made tragic by both Guts's unawareness and also what happens next. After being transformed into the boy against his will a handful of times, Griffith understands what's happening to him and decides to take advantage of it, killing two birds with one stone. He infiltrates Elfhelm as the Moonlight Boy, and when he turns back into himself, he kidnaps the one person intrinsically tied to his weakness, Casca. He also destroys Elfhelm for good measure while he's at it, and proves to Guts that he's beyond man's reach by making him look like a fool that's swinging Dragon Slayer at practically nothing. With Casca in his possession, Griffith is fully untouchable now, because he has an insurance policy on hand should his body go rogue on a full moon again. You'd think that this would be all the more reason for Guts to want to kill Griffith as soon as possible, but right now, it doesn't look like that'll ever happen. When the Falcon took Casca, he broke guts. The Black Swordsman had struggled through the impossible for years trying to get her mind back, and now that they finally had that, she was taken away from him again, possibly rendered mindless too. He couldn't protect her when it mattered most, and even though he did everything right, things still turned out the way they did. Right now, he's pretty much in a catatonic state, thanks to his many mental and emotional stresses, as well as the fatigue caused by the Berserker armor, but once he recovers, what will he do? The last half a dozen chapters chapters of Berserk have shown him at rock bottom. He can't even stand up straight without hallucinating about Griffith and throwing up. If giving up were his destination, he's halfway there. And what about when he learns Griffith's true nature? Sure, Guts doesn't know it now, but he's bound to find out that his demon child lives within Griffith sooner or later. How will that change his approach to the whole thing, considering the fact that he knows just how much Casca cherishes the boy? In the time they've spent together since being reunited, the only moments where he sees her smile is when she's with the Moonlight Boy. And, turns out, that's because she can feel that she's his mother. Will Guts be willing to kill Griffith once he learns that it will kill the boy as well and sever the one connection that anchored Casca's mind during her mindless years? If this were the Black Swordsman arc Guts, we wouldn't even hesitate to answer our own question. But you can see now why this is such a conundrum, right? Guts hasn't killed Griffith yet because it's nigh impossible and he's trying to be a better man. He changed his mind for Casca's sake, stuck to it through moments where he doubted all of it, but now that she's gone, who's to say he won't do everything humanly possible to get her back? And yet, what if that that choice 
Alice breaks her again, and no quarter of dreams is able to restore her this time. It seems to us that physical knowledge is the key to killing Griffith, because the pieces don't add up. How can he be so powerful and yet need a physical body to work his magic properly? How would Guts' approach to killing him change if he knew Griffith's weakness and the fact that Rickard slapped him once? Would he become strategic and plan everything down to the last detail, or would he pull a Guts and just swing for the fences? Knowing him, if things come down to that level, Guts would choose the latter, and it's just as well. We don't think Guts can handle another breakdown like the one he recently had, unless the story involves him getting institutionalized in the near future. In our opinion, the only way Guts kills Griffith, powers and all, is by accepting his true feelings towards the guy and letting it go. We're not saying he needs to forgive Griffith, we're saying he needs to stop letting his past define his present and future. That's the true key to killing Griffith, whether he's a god hand or a human being. Until Guts can do that, it's impossible for him to prevail. Marvelous Verdict! Unlike Guts and Griffith, this is where we're gonna have to kill the video for today. Let us know what you think about why Guts is letting Griffith live after everything he's done down in the comments, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more Berserk content, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Till then, this is Wizard Wheezy signing off, but don't forget, keep on struggling, strugglers.